said it was on, but it's on. Okay. Okay. Test, test, test. Okay. Um, just make sure that I don't get near this microphone. Okay. So no feedback, right? On that. For the folks in the back, if you just want to come closer, there's lots of space to fill here. Yeah. Come on now. So I've got 12 o'clock, so I think we're ready to go. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks to those of you who made it through the blustery weather. I'm sure there are more online than usual today. Uh, my name is Felix Hone. I'm a professor here at the College of Law and the chair of the Speakers Committee. I would like to welcome you to the 2024 Wunusue Lecture in Aboriginal Law. As we gather here today, we acknowledge we are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. The Wunusue Lecture in Aboriginal Law is an annual lecture featuring a topic related to Aboriginal law or policy. I would like to thank the various individuals and corporations who have donated to the Unisway Lecture Fund. I'd also like to acknowledge the Honorable Gerald M. Moran, KC Officer of the Order of Canada and former Provincial Court Judge of Saskatchewan for his key contributions to this lecture. The donations assist the college in engaging prominent Indigenous speakers to address issues of social, critical social importance, in turn benefiting students, faculty, and the legal community at large. Now to introduce our guest speaker for today, Duma Young KC is an Elnu Mi'kmaq from Maligawatch Reserve, and his band is the Eskasoni First Nation. Duma was born into the Squirrel Clan for the Rabbit Clan. He is the spouse of Nicolas Honig and resides in Sydney River, where he teaches Mi'kmaq studies at Cape Breton University and has a private legal practice focusing on Indigenous law, Aboriginal law, health law, estates, board governance, adjudication, and arbitration. Duma also gives back by offering pro bono legal services to the community. Duma grew up on his mother's trap line at Maligawatch, where he learned Alnuin Pisun, or plant medicine, and later undertook studies in ethnobotany, the study of plants used by indigenous peoples. And he loves to lead Alnuin Pisun medicine walks, showing folks which plants are used by the Alnu people and illustrating the importance of biodiversity in Mi'kmaq. Duma's other research interests is, are in reclaiming and restoring Elnue de Plutathan, sorry if I massacred that, <laughs> um, Mi'kmaq legal principles, the traditional roles and responsibilities of two-spirited people and the political activism of the Elnu from the 1900s to the present. In addition, 
Duma is the first El Nuisit fluent Mi'kmaq speaking lawyer called to the bar in Nova Scotia in 2001. He was also the first Indigenous president of a law society in Canada when he became the president of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society in 2021. He currently sits as the Nova Scotia board representative on the Canadian Bar Association and is a proud member of the Indigenous Bar Association, Cape Breton Barrister Society and the Nova Scotia Barrister Society. Please join me in welcoming Professor Young. Well, Alinti, thank you very much. And uh, being a professor, I also like to, uh, I, I kind of like this little mic here type of thing. So first time ever, instead of being mic'd up out there and stuff, so I feel like uh, almost like Madonna in her early days, right? No, type of thing, yeah, whoa, great. So <clears throat> anyways, uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that um, to the, the to the folks who are uh, the beneficiaries of Treaty Number no. Six, uh, whose land that I am on, and also to the homeland of the Métis people, or as we like to call them, Bilwiel you know, in our language, type of thing. So thank you for inviting me here on their territory. And one of the rule, one of the legal principles that we have as Ilnus that um, I remember my cousin Merdina told us: if you go somewhere, you have to behave. And I'm like, behave how? And she said, she said, you have to behave. And I said, you know, so she said, instead of saying everybody, you know, behave, you tell them, be a good time. You know, so that's what I'm supposed to be, is a good time, right? No, so I'm like, there's lots of things you can end up being a good time. But um, anyways, um, this lecture is about uh, two-spirited people and, and that identity is a Aboriginal and treaty right. And as such, it has various impacts on the current situation and historical stuff. It's really um, very easy for me to say that our identity is the foundation of our Aboriginal treaty rights. I think, and then we can go on to a legal analysis, how to do section 35 analysis, how infringement of cases occurs, and what all the cases of priority and stuff in, in, in comparison to other uh, Aboriginal treaty rights, how to prove them, et cetera, type of thing. That's a, uh, that's a very academic approach and a very legal approach, and that's very much necessary, et cetera. But I'm also a little bit of a storyteller. So part of what I'm going to say is stories. You know? and, and it's in these stories that we find our histor history, our, uh, our indigenous legal principles. And I'm going to be using that phrase a lot of times. But really, what I really know is our Mi'kmaq laws. You know? And I can tell you our experience with Mi'kmaq laws, and given the fact that Mi'kmaq people or Ulnu people were cousins to the Algonquin speaking tribes. So we're very much cousins to um, other Algonquin or Abenaki tribes, and also to the Cree, or, and also to the Anishinaabe. You know, our languages are very familiar, right? Many, many things, right? So our stories, tell us about two-spirited people. And I'm going to use that phrase, two-spirited, because that phrase was coined back in the early 1990s, you know, at a gathering, uh, maybe it was even earlier in the late 1980s, it was at a gathering in, I believe it was in Minneapolis or Minnesota. Um, a gathering of two-spirited uh, folks came together, and at the time it was called the Gay and Lesbians, you know, Gay and Lesbian Indians. And so they gathered together, and it was coined two-spirited people. We were supposed to use that phrase. It's an interim phrase. Our agreement at that time was that we'll use it because it's an English phrase, and our job was to go back into each of our nations and find out what the word was for two-spirited people. No. And in some communities, that was easier said than done. It's very difficult, you know, because of the impact of colonization has reduced languages to, um, in some communities to extinction, 
No. Others are uh, struggling. And I will even say, even in our own uh, Mi'kmaq communities, we are also struggling to save the language. You know? in some communities, it's almost been wiped out. You know? So there's very, very, you know, we have a small and dwindling number of speakers. And same with the Wulustuguag people. Um, among the Wulustuguag, there's less, there's about 100 people left that can only speak Wulustuguag. So, <clears throat> our stories tell us this history about two-spirited people. And when I started doing research in Unuak Debludan, I looked at it and I said, it's our worldview is how we experience the world. And it's in this worldview that our laws or our legal principles are located in. And it's expressed through our language, songs, chants, dances, ceremonies, rituals, etc. It's very difficult to cite these using the McGill citation guide. You know? So where did you get it? So anyways, one of the interesting stories I used to think was uh, how people can, um, we often say that there's indigenous laws and then we can always think about them. My family, um, we grew up in Maliguej, and I, you've heard the introduction, that I grew up in my mother's trap line. And while my family tried to teach me how to hunt, trap, fish, etc., type of thing, I wasn't very good at it. So they said, oh, that one we're going to have to send to school. <laughs> you know, uh, He's going to starve if he's going to be, you know. So anyway, that's how I became a lawyer, right? Anyways, um, one of the things about that is that you know, we think about these two-spirited stories. And also, that my family was also, my cousin used to dance Kojiwa dance. It's a traditional dance. If you go to many Mi'kmaq communities, and which you go to a powwow, it's kind of a standard powwow that you will see all across their line. We do have the, the grass dancers, the jingle dancers, the fancy dancers, you know, the big drums, etc. that thing. But really, that's not who we are. You know, we're forest-dwelling people. You know, we're not exactly plains. But you know, as the, the you know that pan-indigenous American style has come, we embraced it. You know, and adopted and changed. But we still have this one Gojuwa dance. And one of the things I like to do is like to you know, when I was a little kid, my cousin told me, he set me aside, and he says, "You're going to have to do this a little bit different than everybody else." I'm going to teach you how to do it, you know. So he taught me how to do the gojuwa, slightly different than everybody else. So when I would go and perform the gojuwa, and people, would, uh, all the elders, would, oh, look at Tuma, he's dancing, the, oh, well, that's very good dancing stuff. And then it's then later on that when I went to Indian Island and I was there with an elder, and she said, uh, she said, you're one of those folks that have the two spirits or two souls. I thought she said, I said, yes. She said, I want to show you something. So she took me to the island, and there's two dancing circles there. And she said, people like you dance in the up outside circle and outside. And I said, but that's not what I was told. And this is a funny little joke, too, I also use. Um, how many unknown people, how many indigenous people does it take to change a light bulb, right? No. You know? <laughs> 50. Yeah. Want to change it 49 to say that's not how I was taught. <laughs> <laughs> so same and that's what I told this one morning. That's not how I was taught. I said, you know, I was and she said, Where did you go dance? I said, Bolotek. And she I said, There's only one circle there. And she said, Well, yeah, that's a very Christian Catholic mission. If the priest knew about you, you know, if they knew that you were two spirited or um, one of those people, they said, they would have put you to death. So in order to hide you, that information went underground and was kept hidden. But the people knew because of the way I danced. Just slightly different, right? And it's very, you know, I see them now. There's a resurgence of the Gojuwa dance everywhere and stuff like this, and people are trying to, and I, and I keep thinking to myself, you know, that's not how I was taught, you know? And I really hope that someday, you know. So I tell people, okay, it's a very, you know, um, I know that we might not have a little bit room, but if, if everybody just stands up a little bit here, just stand up and I'll show you. Okay. Now, it's very easy. You take this foot 
slide it back and forth three times. One, two, three, right? And then this foot, stamp it three times. Okay? Now switch, slide this back three times, and then stamp this one three times. Now do it together at the same time. These shoes are not working on this rug there. Well, hold on for a second. Okay? Yeah. Like that. It's a little bit like going you know, like that. But that way, I, today you see them go and they kick out like that. They're kind of going like this, right? And I'm like, hey, I, see, I find like I'm one of those like old auntie said. No, like, anyways, that's, that's one of the stories that comes in. That's where we're going to find our Elnu Debludan or our indigenous laws. It's in these stories. In fact, like many Algonquin speaking tribes, and I'm pretty sure that um, I would guess that the, among the Cree or the Anishinaabe or even with the Métis, winter is the time for telling stories, like we do. Yes. When we enter into the wigwams, we didn't have teepees, we entered into wigwams. In the winter, we would start telling stories, and we would tell stories. You know, and so that's how we would do these things. So, and our stories show that um, our communities and our ceremonies included two-spirited people. And again, I use that term two-spirited as a temporary thing until I find the word that properly describes it. The difficulty in our language is that it's often we think about it as a noun when it really should be a verb. Our languages are very verb-based, action-oriented. So they focus on what you do, not who you are. So an acceptance on that way, right? So, so if you think about our indigenous laws, they're rooted in our worldview, and I explained, our worldview is rooted in our dances, the Gojuwa. With that in mind, one time I was at the Eskisoni Powwow, and my cousin was there, and she said, I like to dance the Gojuwa. She said, well, all, they're all dancing, fancy dances, jingle dresses, and stuff like this. She said, after the, okay, I said, I think you're supposed to offer them tobacco. I said, and she said, oh, I don't have tobacco. You know how expensive that is, tobacco? I said, I said, yeah, I think, but I said, you can also use a cigarette. I'm like that. And she said, really? She said, I said, not a pouch or anything. I said, yeah, just any tobacco would do. No. And I said, really, some of our older women, it wasn't pouch tobacco, it was chewing tobacco you know, that they used, the old ladies that they would use. So my mother is one of the old ladies that chewed tobacco, so we got a little piece from her, they took it over. And she came back, my cousin said, she said, they came back and told her she couldn't dance the Gojua. And they said, I said, why? They said she wasn't allowed to dance because she, was, she wasn't wearing a skirt. And I'm like, oh? I said, and they said, they told her that's our law. And I said, never heard of that one before. I said, no. I said, given the fact that Mi'kmaq people, well, new people, were forced, well, were forced people, skirts are not really all that practical. Our women wore leggings and smocks. No, that's the traditional regalia. I said, let me go ask them. So I asked them. And I said to the drummers, I said, I hear this is the case and this is the law. And they said, yes, it is. I said, who said this? Our elders. Which elder? They couldn't tell me. Along the ways, they had heard it from this one or this one or this one. It, is, it seemed to be popped out of the air. And I said, you know, one of the things is that if you tell me who told you and you can you know, say that the elder has a valid reason, then it'll be accepted. It's almost like the Miguel citation guide, you know, if you cite it properly, right? No, so they couldn't. And I said, but we make up our own laws type of thing. So I said, no, one of the things, how do we find it? So it's in our language, songs, ceremonies, dances, culture, etc. cetera, that thing. So El knows we have historically six worlds that we deal with. You know, the world beneath the earth, you know, or the world beneath the water, you know, the, uh, the earth world, the world above the earth, and the world above the sky, and spiritual world or the ghost world. Now, all of our stories tell us about these worlds. And they're all teaching stories 
They tell us how we're supposed to behave in, when we encounter other life forces in all of these worlds. You know? So when you go into the world, the scouts will go ahead and come back and tell the others, okay, this is the four life forces that I've seen in this world. This is the rituals, this is the ceremonies, this is the protocols, etc. This is how you're supposed to behave. These teaching stories are to keep us safe because each of these worlds can be very dangerous. As you go into the deep, deep woods, it can be very dangerous. You know? But really, they're all metaphors for going inside of yourself. Right? No? How you good? So, and one of the things about it is that two-spirited people in the new culture were the people that went into these worlds, were the scouts, and they came back and told everybody else what's to be expected. You know? So, in our stories, all of creation is fluid, constantly changing, evolving. You know? In the state of, you would need to renew these relationships, to renew the energy by ceremonies. That's why we do ceremonies, we renew the energy. All of nature is in flux. Winter goes into spring, spring goes into summer, into fall, and back again. You know, everything seems to run down. You know? And same with our own human existence, right? So we always need to recharge this and keep it bringing it up through ceremonies. So that's why we do a lot of ceremonies at very diff different times. Ceremonies for this, ceremonies for that. You know? so, and in our ceremonies, the stories are told, and these stories show of all of our life forces changing form and shape according to the will of the people, and the whole gist of human life, or, or life in general, for anybody, is to come acquire power. Not power over somebody, but power, you know, in terms of survivability and empowerment. And so the highest form of it is when you get to the full extent of human experience, is that you become a mikamuwes, a spiritual being, you know. And these spiritual beings will manifest themselves or show themselves to people who go into the woods who may be lost, and the Mingam West will come in form in their shape. Now the Mingam West has been described as being very beautiful life forces which contain both the male and the female energies. You know? So that's what our stories all talk about, you know, how we behave in these worlds, right? So the structure of the stories also take on this stuff. So the structure, the form, the you know, the the it always changes shapes. You know, and the gender, the creation of these stories is up to the storyteller to tell. That's the same as me when I tell you the stories. These will change. Like, for example, the little story about how many native people does it take to take the light bulb. Now, you will use that in whatever form. You will say, how many Crees will take it? How many Métis will change it, right? No, it changes from, you know, type of thing. So, all elements in creation are fluid, we change. That's important, and that's how we knew about two-spirited people, that there was a fluidity there, you know. So, I think about it, our lives are all about fluidity. I'm not the same person I was when I was a child. As an early teenager, I'm not the same person. As a young adult, I'm not the same person. Why, heck, I'm not even the same person uh, before when I went to law school. When I became a lawyer, I've been practicing for a while. Hello, Jordy, how are you? I'm good. So I'm not the same person, and so are you. So there's a constant fluidity associated with all this, right? You know, and I'm sure that I won't be the same person when I retire. There's constant changes. So my form changes, my shape changes, my outlook changes, you know, everything. That's just fluidity in life. So, and again, I go back to our stories, our language contains the laws that uh, impact upon us here. So, sometimes in these stories, we'll offer, and I'm, and I'm using Mi'kmaq stories here, and you can use your Cree stories or you know, other stories or other indigenous tribe stories. Sometimes these Mi'kmaq, or these spiritual beings, they live in special places. 
mountains, trees, plants. They can also change their form at any given time. So sometimes you'll see a special, like a mountain that looks like a human being. Where we have is Glooskap's cave in Cape Breton, Unemagi, where our god, Glooskap, went there and he said, whenever you need me, come over here. So that's there. There's a, his shape of his face embedded in the rock. Sometimes our rocks, we tell people, you know, people have a mistake. They think that, you know, we tell them that uh, every single thing has a spirit. That's not quite true. You know, we t I tell them, no, that's not. Not every rock has a spirit, but some do. So you have to kind of treat them all as if they do. And how do you know which ones? By the way they feel when you pick them up. That's why we call them, you know, in the sweat lodge, we call them grandfather rocks. You know? Young children, toddlers, as you're walking around, they'll be, they'll be picking up rocks, this one, this one, coming to you. They're picking up their ancestors. And that's how we see it, right? No. So, and same thing with uh, two-spirited people. You know, you, they'll be picking up rocks, powers, and stuff like this as part of their roles, right? And so, other symbols of uh, different beings, thunder beings, wood wind beings, people who create the winds, you know, they're all there. So in these, there's always constantly shape-shifting. You know? so, so one of the words that I have started to think about for describing two-spirited people in our community is megamoesque. People who are acquiring spiritual powers. No. People who are acquiring knowledge. People who are going out to be the scouts and bringing back this knowledge to our communities. So that's, that's megamoesque. Another form of it is uh, what we used to call was blowing. One of the courses that I took in my undergraduate year was, um, um, it was really funny because I, Graduated from Dalhousie with my uh, certificate in addictions counseling. So I'm on the red row too, you know. And we went there. We did our uh, red um, counseling certificate with uh, social work degree uh, courses in social work. And they were interested in having us all go to social work school, school of social work. I said, no, I got to go find out who I am. And I went did my undergraduate degree in Mi'kmaq studies. And um, one of the things about this is that. Uh, um, my cousin Mardina was teaching there, and one of the things she always made us do was said, you have to know who you are, where you came from. So her exam at Christmas time was, you had to do your fi family tree, find out who you're related to. You know? And she also said, be careful now, because you know, things may be popping up that you don't really want to know, right? Know who you're related to. You might find other stuff, right? So I did my family tree, and when I went there, I, spoke to, I, I wrote down what I knew, and then I spoke to my mother, and she told me what she knew, and then she said, you got to go see Wolford, your cousin Wolford. He's an elder in the community. So we went there, and she said, i got to go with you. So we, I went with And so her and Wolford had a conversation as to who I was related to. I knew that I couldn't ask any questions. I was just supposed to listen. So they were talking. And then Wolford said, I can't tell you anymore, but you got to go see Uncle Simon. Uncle Simon was one of our oldest elders, and his wife, Malij, my cousins. So we went to go see them. My mother said, I have to go with you. You can't go see them by yourself. I don't know. I got my notes. I got my network back. I can do this interview. No problem. I said, I understand. Well, no. She said, no, you can't do this. I said, I've got to go with you. So we went. And when we got there, she offered them chewing tobacco. She pulled out her uh, pouch of chewing tobacco. And while he started, and as Uncle Simon, they were all sat there and they all chewed tobacco. And I'm like, when do we start, right? No, and I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then my mother told them what I was there for. And then she wouldn't say anything. So Uncle Simon and Malik started talking to each other. And my goal was to just to listen. And then Malik stopped talking. She said, that's all I can remember. And then Uncle Simon started remembering more and more. He was talking to himself out loud. Now at one point he said, he stopped and he said, and Gil, you come from a, a whole bunch of buwawinach, ach, omechayach. You come from a whole family of spiritual beings. You know, there's lots of you around in the family. 
you know. And I was like, Boina? I said, that's like, what I had heard that was a warlock, a witch, somebody who can curse you or something like that. I said, I don't want to be one of those, right? No. But Ome Chaya is really an anglicized version of old maid. You know? They had no word for lesbian. You no, know? but they say old maid, old maid chaya. So anyways, so that's what okay, there's something here. You know. So in these telling of these stories, knowing who you are and being told that there's, there's a whole history there. That's very important for when we're looking at establishing, you know, the right for, as an Aboriginal right or Indigenous right. You know, they have to have a historical background to it. These stories that were told are really about telling our children how they can live in these worlds safely. Now, the old worlds, the world beneath the water, the world beneath the earth, the world, the earth world, the world above the sky, the world above the earth, and the ghost world, they can be changed to all the different worlds we exist today. You know, as a lawyer, I occupy different worlds. I have an office in Member 2, the world of the res, the legal regula regulation world, you know, the Barrister Society of Nova Scotia, or the Law Society of Saskatchewan, as you may, you know. I occupy political worlds. I advise politicians. You know, I advise clients, different worlds. I uh, go into hospitals, you know, and I, you know, many things, and I, you know, advise elders. So there's many different worlds that I exist in. And I also do many things. So I move constantly in different worlds, like all of you do. We all do these worlds. So our job is to think about what are the indigenous laws as we move through these worlds. And one of the worlds that I'm also moving is two-spirited worlds. What are the indigenous law regarding two-spirited people? What are our roles, what are our responsibilities to ourselves, to others, and to our communities, and to our nations? You know, what are the laws there, right? So, in some ways, our two-spirited folks and our kinship need to know about who they are and how their identities are rooted in indigenous legal traditions so that they can walk through these worlds safely. No. So when we look at indigenous rights or Aboriginal rights, one of the key foundations of it is identity. There's no gateway around it. Who we are as distinct peoples. In fact, the courts use that word distinct. You know, in establishing Aboriginal rights, you know, distinct or integral to the culture, to the being, etc. type of thing. You'll hear it in many of the small claim, not small claim courts, look at me, that's, a, that's my adjudicated role coming out right now. I was going to say Supreme Court cases, like for example, Sparrow and the Van de Peet test, etc. You'll get all that words and you'll hear those words distinct, integral, you know, coming out. So what's more distinct and integral than our own identity as indigenous people? You know, what makes us different? What also makes us indigenous is that the multiple layers of identity that we all occupy every single day in our entire lives. Every single one of us has multiple layers of identity and that all form part and parcel of who we all are. In fact, um, my colleague, John R. Sillaboy, who works with me on the Wabanaki Two-Spirit Lines, he's doing his PhD at McGill, and he's going to be writing about two-spirited identity. And one of the things we figured out in the research that we've done is that even among ourselves, our, ide our own new identity is the foundation. Before we are anything, anybody else or anything else, before we are two-spirited, before we are queer, we, before we are gay, before we are lesbian, before we are bi or trans or non-gender conforming, we are unno. No, that's the key from, and that's where it provides the most support that we can provide is that our foundation for all of these comes from our indigenous identity. So our identity as indigenous people is really is part and parcel of our sovereignty. And sovereignty, you will hear many, many things about this sovereignty as you, you know, go through the law schools, and it's about who we are 
and how we occupy the space, the worlds that we all are, you know, and in terms of our self-government, our governance of ourselves. Before we can even get there, we have to know who belongs, who is a part of our community, who is a member. And so I, I tell people, so our indigenous rights is about the right to know who you are and what you are, you know? And that's encoded in our language. Once you, you know, our verb-based languages, who you are and what you are. And that's part of our rights there, you know. It is an inherent right, and it's to define, sustain, and continue our identities as indigenous people, whether you're Elnu, Wolostogwe, Haida, or Indi, it's, it's foundational to the rest of it all, right, you know, our identity. And it's similar to our identity as two-spirited people, you know. So I tell folks, find out what the words are in your own language. And if you don't know, find somebody who does, you know. I know that there is recently on our little, and social media is wonderful, and social media can be a terrible place too, right, no? In our little group, I just noticed that uh, one of our workers posted that they had found some Cree words regarding two-spirited people. You know, some were new, some were made, and I don't speak Cree, and I don't really know, but I thought, excellent, how do we do? That's where our laws are located. So, if it's written in Cree, then there are indigenous laws relating to it, right? No. So, so, and one of the things, uh, self-determining people, and I got these little notes here for myself to just keep me on track, but uh, you'll see me going a little off every once in a while. So, illness as self-determining, we have the freedom to choose the pathways of our lives and the paths to the ways to these worlds and how to express our identity in these worlds. How do you introduce yourself to other life forces in these areas? When I come here, you know, I, I remember preparing for this, I, uh, somebody asked me, they said, can you send me your bio? And I'm like, I got like about 10 different bios. Which one do you want? Short one, long one, big one, tall one? I said, what context? Academic bio, work bio, et cetera. Type of thing. They said, mm, well, just whatever you want to be into. I said, all of them, I have to be introduced in a traditional manner. If there's Elnus there, I have to be introduced in a traditional manner. Elnus never asked me, what's your credentials? What's your PhD? You know, do you have PhD? Do you have master's or what's your law degree? And stuff? They always said, who are you? Where are you from? Who are your people? And that's how we determine who is a beneficiary of our Aboriginal treaty rights in our territory. Who are you? Who are your people? And, you know, where are you from? You know, and I say this and I jokingly say, nobody's ever asked me what my band number is. No, nobody's ever asked me for my status number. Well, actually, that's not true. Yeah, Department of uh, Indigenous Affairs sometimes will ask me for my status number, right? No, uh, you know, here it is. But when I come into community, nobody. But they will ask those questions to establish who I am. And then when I present myself, I say, I was born into the squirrel clan for the rabbit clan. And to show other owners that I do have rights and obligations belonging to my clans, but I also have obligations to other clans too. And that's part of the whole vision. And so I also say I'm a two-spirited person, and that shows what my rights and obligations are and my roles and responsibilities are. No, through that word and that language. So really, if you think about it, self-government or self-governing ourselves, which identity is part, there's a foundational part of it, is really about putting the principles of self-sovereignty uh, and self-determination in practice. That's self-government. No. So. One of the views about our indigenous rights, and uh, I think it's fairly, I mean, I may be preaching to the choir here in a way type of thing, is that the indigenous views of the source of our rights is not that they're not delegated from Canada or anybody else or by statute or anything like that. They are inherent and they spring and they were given to us by the creator. 
Yeah? That's the source of our rights. You know, you know, and there's always a distinction between when you're negotiating with Canada or the provinces as to whether, you know, how enactments are going to be. That's been always a bit of a, bit of a thick, uh, um, sticking point. Indigenous people in our territory will always say they're inherent. We want to see them. Well, sometimes you have to kind of, you know, compromise to get things done, stuff like this, and you have to say, okay, okay, you can say that they're from Canada and stuff like that, but we still don't believe it, right? No? So, and that they're the source of our laws and our identity is the expression of our people, you know? So sovereignty, when we talk sovereignty, or we use the term gimitkina or gimitkinen, our land, or our, really it's about our relationship to the land. It's really another word for sovereignty or self-government or self-determination. You know, our responsibilities to the land. It's really about our relationship with the land and with others on the land. And that's one way our treaties are all about relationships, uh, how we're going to establish our relationships with each other. In my territory, we have peace and friendship treaties, what they're called peace and friendship treaties, or the covenant chain of treaties, as they're also known. Um, basically, I tell people you know, when we do peace and friendship treaties, we promise not to kill you, and you promise not to kill us. And that's on the source. But they're more than just that. They're about establishing relationships. They're more about establishing trade, economics, you know, and dispute resolution. We have institutions in there. And basic treaty interpretation principles, and many of you are law students or lawyers, and you, you know, I'm not going to repeat how you go and find these treaty interpretation principles. Suffice to say, they've been very well outlined. A, they have to be seen from the indigenous perspective. You know. Two, they have to be given a broad uh, and liberal interpretation. You know, as to how the illness would have thought of them. And, th and the other one is that if it's not written in a treaty, then that jurisdiction is retained by the tribe themselves. So if there's no any mention of identity in here, or even as two-spirit in the treaty, then that jurisdiction rests with the Ilnu people or with the indigenous people themselves. So, so from, but uh, from Canada's, you know, one of the things that I've learned in law school is that when we were in there and we had to do our moats and everything, and I understand that some students are doing their moats right now, et cetera, God, oh, wish you all the best of luck in them, you know. <laughs> they were, those were kind of fun, right? But I remember my first moat type of thing, and we were there, and I was the prosecutor in the case, and it was, I don't I even forget what the case was, but I was ready to fight and hard and send this person to be to the gallows and you know go and send them all over to, you know send them to prison for a hundred million years and stuff like that and so I paired I pre prepared and everything like this and my team was all there we were the, we researched the law etc type of thing and we were going to give it all we got to show that we were good at this and we were in halfway in our arguments then the judge, Moot judge, who was a you know, retired supernumerary judge from downtown, he stopped us and said, okay, now switch places. And we're like, what? I'm supposed to be the defense now? You know, I never prep for the defense. And he says, as lawyers, you have to know the other side to just as much as your side. You should be able to switch just like that. And I'm like, Oh, I don't know if I can. Because my whole body was into going here. And to step outside that comfort zone and to go into another area, it was different. So, when preparing for this as two-spirited people, not only do I have to know the indigenous perspective of an Aboriginal or treaty right on identity, and especially on identity on two-spirited people, I have to also know what the other side is looking at, the Canadian perspective, the provincial perspective, the religious perspective, the people who don't like us perspective too. I have to know their side too because I have to be prepared. You know, and full preparedness means seeing the whole thing. It's what we call in Mi'kmaq having the eagle vision. The eagle vision, you know, they say, 
you know, views, flies high, so high, you can see everything. And sometimes the eagle has to come down and look at particular spots and how they interrelate with each other. But you have to see the whole vision. And how we see this is something like, you know, our perspectives are often very, very different. I would open this bottle. Mm. I don't want, I don't want to pick on you, but you're the one closest to me here. So I'm going to put this bottle here, and you tell me what you see. I see a water bottle with water in it. I see water bottles, and I see water in it, and I see a barcode. Do you see bar? Do you see a barcode? Not from where I'm sitting. But so, if you don't see it, then you must be wrong. But I see a barcode, and I see my, and I can tell you, my truth is my truth. That's the eagle vision. We have to see the whole thing, and that's one of the roles and responsibilities of two-spirited people. One of the things I tell folks is that it's not enough to accept or tolerate two-spirited people. We need to celebrate, you know. And you can, you know, and I get it, but people are often hesitant or they will make mistakes and stuff like this. I remember one time, <clears throat> this is dating me a little bit back, back in the 1980s, <clears throat> I used to, you know, I um, was a healthcare worker, a health outreach worker by the state of California. I was working in the Mission District in San Francisco because I learned when I was a little kid that all the gays and lesbians were in San Francisco with flowers in their hair and patchouli oil. And that's where I was going to go, and that's where I ended up in. But my community said, you got to come back. I said, okay. So I learned, and because we were doing HIV AIDS education and health education, and they said, we need help to come back. So I went back. And I learned as much, and I was doing it, and I became kind of the expert, I guess, in a way. And so one day I was sitting at the laundry mat doing my clothes. I was like, you know, I watched these two, two, two people go by, street-based people, you know. And the man was going there, and he was going walking there, and the woman was back. And the woman fell off the curb, and she fell and hit her head on the pavement. And she laid there. The man kept going. He didn't see her. So I was like, oh, my God. I ran outside, and uh, I looked, and I said to the, laun the woman who ran the laundry mat, I said, call 911. We've got to get an ambulance here, because she's bleeding from the head, she's injured. You know, the woman was laying there. So she ran in there, so I said, okay. So I, the woman lifted herself up, and I helped support her, and I put my hand on the back of her head. And there was blood running down my hand. Okay. So I'm standing there, helping her, stuff like this, right? And the police arrived. When you call 911 in Halifax, the police always arrive, you know, before the ambulance and stuff like that. Even though the, the police arrived and they, were, they put on the rubber gloves, and I got a little bit insulted. Here I am, health educator. I know all about how AIDS is going to be transmitted, how it's not transmitted. I know the skin is a wonderful barrier. You'll never get it through the skin, stuff like this. But I want, took this opportunity to educate and everything. I told the police officer, I said, there's nothing to worry about. You won't get uh, AIDS from just blood on your hands. And she said, yeah, I know that. But you can get hepatitis. And I went, ah! <laughs> I panicked. Because I didn't know that information. I panicked. And I reacted badly. And I went into the laundry mat and went away. And the laundry woman said, hey, it's a bleach and stuff like this. Blood. And I was like, oh my god, things are going to happen. And I said, because I didn't know, I couldn't provide the best service possible. And it needed me. I needed to find out. So that's why I tell people that in our Aboriginal treaty rights, our identity, and as two-spirited people, the more we know, the more we're not going to react. And often, that's what happens. When people don't know, they react. And it's OK to make mistakes. I tell people, acknowledge the mistake, and then move on. I, uh, I, uh, I've been uh, misgendered many times by elders. And uh, early on, I was always a little rah, 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 you know, kind of. And then I realized that there's hardly any pronouns in Mi'kmaq. We're verb-based language. We're not a whole bunch of nouns. Very little pronouns. In fact, there's really only one, nekam, which means that life force. 
And elders, when they would try to speak English, they would say, they would say oh, Duma, Duma, she's a very good lawyer. And I'm like, not she. And they would say, he, or they would say all sorts of, you know, misgender me like this. And I would get annoyed. And this was very, very common. And I found it, and it wasn't just for two-spirit people. I found, and I'm like, what's going on here? I said, what is this all about, right? And then I realized it's because they were trying to speak through the language of the oppressor, English or French. And, but in Mi'kmaq, they were quite right on. So I'm like, okay, this is something, right? No. So it's the same thing with our indigenous laws and our Aboriginal rights. A lot of folks know we have them. But just like those drummers at the powwow, they sometimes will pull them out of the air and think what they are. We'll, actually, we'll say, we have an Aboriginal right to do this, for this. But often we don't follow it up with the correspondence obligation. What is my right as a two-spirited people, as an indigenous person who's two-spirited, what is my indigenous rights? What are my treaty rights? as a beneficiary of those. Then the next thing is, what are my obligations to commit Kinook, to the land? You know, those are just as important too. So from Canada's perspectives, going back to my little move there, you gotta know the other side too. Like here in this case, well, I know the Saskatchewan has just recently passed that law uh, last year regarding uh, uh, what they deem to be parental rights, right? And uh, you know, and use the notwithstanding clause, you know, to do that. In the event that I say I assert that our rights as identity are rooted in our indigenous or Aboriginal treaty rights, those are protected under Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution, which is outside of the Charter. The notwithstanding clause doesn't apply. On the surface, Saskatchewan has not properly consulted. If you're going to infringe or try to extinguish our Aboriginal rights to our identity, then you have to do a consultation process. And uh, in, in the, the, the depth of the consultation process and the accommodations that's required is also on the depth of the infringement. If it's a minor infringement, you don't have to do a whole lot. If it's a major one, then you have to do a whole lot in accommodations and stuff like this. Because identity is at the foundation of our indigenous rights, it's a major infringement. So that's why if, if this piece of legislation purports to infringe upon the Aboriginal or indigenous rights to identity, especially to two-spirited people, and it has supplementary relationships to education as an Aboriginal right, then there needs to be a widespread consultation and deep consultation before it can be implemented. Same arguments are going to be, so one of the things we need to know is that what's the other side thinking? How is it going to be prepared? That's why we also, I have to be prepared to know that other side too. One of the things I also say that, bec and people will say, well, indigenous laws relating to identity or two-spirit people were displaced when Canada asserted its sovereignty. No, nope, that's not true. The common law, basically, if it's not in there, if it's not stated, if it's not uh, clear and plain on the surface, then it got absorbed in the common law. So indigenous rights related to identity and two-spirit people were absorbed in the common law and formed part of the common law and are protected, you know, in some way. And and our laws were not displaced with the assertion of crown sovereignty or Canadian sovereignty. Because like, it didn't happen everywhere else. Quebec kept their civil code. Why not indigenous people kept their indigenous laws? Indigenous laws regarding two-spirited people is one aspect of it. So Quebec can keep their laws. And when they came into Canada, they, they didn't get displaced. Indigenous laws did not get displaced. So, but there is, I know that there is part of the legal battles and I often tell people we need to take a critical race analysis when we go into court. Sometimes what we think is a good thing and we want to fight it in court 
is always a bit of a gamble. You may win, but you also may lose. It's like that little, not the Gojuwa dance, but we have another dance, the ego, where you step three times, one, two, three, forward, and two steps back. And sometimes we win three steps, but you win last two steps back. And you have to bust the bugs. That's what they were telling us when we were kids. You got to bust the bugs, right? No. And it's really hard. We got them down. Three steps forward. Sometimes our court cases are much like that. On the surface, we'll see them as a big win, you know. But then when you look into it, it's not quite that much of a win. It's a little bit. It's that three steps forward, but you get two steps back. You know, and Mi'kmaq people, we've experienced those quite often. The Marshall case on commercial treaty fishing. Three steps forward, two steps back. You know, um, et cetera. Um, you know, the Simon case on the 1752 treaty. Three steps forward, two steps back. Even Delgamuk, the national one you know, regarding Aboriginal title, you know, on the surface, it seemed to be a major win. But when you peel back the layers, mm, not quite. You know? But that's the limitations of our legal system, too. I ever, you know, when I was in law school, one of my professors often talked about the legal system is a very dull knife in which to cut away at society's problems. It hacks, but often it's the only knife we have. So, how do we improve it? How do we utilize it and stuff like this? As future lawyers, yourselves, or even lawyers yourselves, I tell people, what I was told early on by my colleagues in the Indigenous Bar Association is that we need to use our own laws. Bring them into the vision that we're going to be using. Bring them into it. And that's what I've been trying to do. So, one of my roles as a two-spirited person is that we solemnize marriages. Now, under the Canadian Constitution, solemnization of a marriage is a provincial head of power. No. The divorce or dissolution of marriage is a federal head of power. You got them there. They're separated and apart, right? No type of thing. So if you want to get married, you've often heard those, you know, everybody kind of heard those little vows that you have to take for better, for worse, etc., in sickness and in health, you know. And then the last of it, the, the minister or the JP or whoever's doing the officiant will say, by the power vested in me under the Marriage Act of Nova Scotia or under the Marriage Act of Saskatoon, etc., I now pronounce you to be spouses, right? So if you want to get divorced, you have to do it according to the federal law. But under Mi'kmaq law, it it's resides in one, both. So, former captain of the Grand Council, um, you know, um, Christmas, a member to, Danny Christmas is uh, the former senator, retired senator of uh, and uh, his grandfather, you know, was a captain in the Grand Council, and he was recorded back in the 1940s or 50s on a wax cylinder, and he sang a song about the marriage song in which he explained how Ulnus got married and why they got married and this is how he got married. And he explained that, the young, and he used the young man, young woman's uh, uh, metaphor there. If the young man wanted to get married, he would tell his parents first. He had to get consent from his parents. He said, okay, you're good, no, we'll give you per consent. Then they would put out a feast, they would call for a four-day feast, and they invite everybody, whoever was interested in marrying him. Sometimes it was three young women would come, two, sometimes one, sometimes none. Again, that has an element of consent, right? No. And so whenever whoever came, he would go and do his song, he would go and do his dance, and so that he went. And if one of them was interested, they would come up and dance with him. And then they would go off and do one year of groom service. In that one year, he had to prove he had, was capable of providing for his family by hunting a moose. A moose is a big animal can feed everybody for a while, can feed the whole family. So, and after a year, they had to come back and they had to announce to the community that the marriage was, you know, was successful. And they had another feast, four days or three days, however much they can afford. Uh, and then they sang more songs and everybody was all happy. But if the marriage was not successful, so they would both come back and they would sing their marriage failure song. They would sing their marriage failure song and I remember 
first time I heard uh, um, you know, uh, Christmas singing this song on these wax tapes, I'm like, oh my God, I heard that same song when I was a kid growing up. My cousin Joey, who taught me the Gojiwa, used to sing it when at the beach, when we were at, you know, fishing for clams or something like that. And he would, uh, I always thought it was a drinking song. They would always have few beer, you could bring it up, la, 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 la. But now I get it, I understood. Uh, he was, Joey was mispronouncing the song. Al dali do the moody, al dali do and then when you know Ben Christmas sang it, he's nige al dali dut, nige al dali dut, al dali dut, which means, now we are moping around, we are moping around, we are not happy, in this marriage, and they announced to the whole community that they were not happy. Once they finished their marriage failure song, then the young woman was free to go back to her parents. He was free to go back to his parents, and they were both free to marry. Now. My thing, well, that's indigenous law, that's Mi'kmaq law. We both had solemnization of marriage and dissolution of marriage in one form, in the song. I mean, mind you, now as a JP, I also tell people, if you want to get married, I want to see you dancing, singing, everything, and they're like, no way, no way, no, we can't be doing that, right? No, hurry up, just say those words quickly. You know, I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this indigenous way. So I bring it back. One of the things about how do we take indigenous laws regarding identity, two-spirited people, and bring it into a contemporary space, contemporary world, those worlds I talked about. That's the difficulty. Finding indigenous laws is not that difficult. You just have to look in the songs, ceremonies, rituals, chants, dances, and our language, our languages. That's where the key is, right? Finding it is not hard. Bringing it into a contemporary space is the difficult one. In Ben Christmas's song, both parties are free to go back. But then the question of what about child support? What about spousal support? What about division of assets? What about pensions, etc. type of thing? That wasn't the case four or five hundred years ago. So how do we do it? And people say, well, our laws. Well, you know what? Indigenous laws also can be adopted and brought back and, you know, and updated. There's no difference than the revised statutes of Canada. They get updated every once in a while. Revised statutes of uh, Nova Scotia or Saskatchewan, they get updated. Some of the old laws, except the Indian Act, that doesn't get updated too much. <laughs> no, type of thing, right? So, our laws and our cultures and our traditions that define our nations continues on. So, one of the ways I bring into a contemporary space is when I do weddings. That's one of the roles of a two-spirited person to solemnize these marriages. You know? And at the end, I'm right, we're supposed to say, by the powers vested in me under the Marriage Act of Nova Scotia, or like you know, if you're an officiant here, by the Marriage Act of, uh, I, I presume it's of Saskatchewan, I now pronounce you to be spouses. I don't say that. I say, by the power vested in me under authority of Unwe de Bludahan, Mi'kmaq Allah, I now pronounce you to be spouses. And that brings Mi'kmaq Allah to a contemporary space. You know, bring it in. In the contracts we do, when there's a, a contract between a, a, a supplier and who's one, somebody wants to supply uh, the band or is you know, opening up a new store, etc. And one of the stores that we open up uh, back home, and I imagine it probably here is cannabis stores. We've got all sorts of them all floating around everywhere. So we tell them, you know what? We can't deal with the cannabis, whatever it is. But we know what? We can set you a separate way that you make your remittances, you have your employment, uh, you go unemployment insurance, your pension plans. Not the courts of Canada, but that's how you do it. It's not a, I, I mean, people think it's this big, big thing. You do it every single day. So when we're looking at two-spirited people, it's not this big, big thing that we have to consider. It's part of our communities, part of our culture. It's already in there. It has been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. We bring it back, and how do we bring it into contemporary times? So that's. So when we're looking at the key, one of the th areas I think about is how do we define our relationships? As two-spirited people, what's our relationship to ourselves, to our 
communities, to our families, to the Canadian state, you know, type of thing. Um, how am I doing for the time? We're pretty close to being out of time. But okay, <laughs> okay. That's the problem with me. I can go on all day for this and all and stuff like this. I got like, you no, know, 10 more slides too, right? You know, so I'll quickly, you know. So when you're reading treaties, uh, okay, let me do it. Our relationships with our Canadian state, with the provinces, is rooted in our treaties. So, like for example, Saskatchewan passed that law, used the notwithstanding clause, that has an impact upon our, its relationship with indigenous peoples here in Saskatchewan. Go to your treaties, see it through there. You know. Treaty interpretation principles apply here. That's where the first steps are. I always tell people, and I tell in our area, we have New Brunswick did the same policy, and we're fighting the court case. We're intervening in the court case with the Canadian Civil Liberties Association with the Wabana Two Spirit Alliance. You know, by the way, we're all going to be looking for fundraising to pay for the lawyers, right? <laughs> Anyways, we tell them that's our. You know, we have to see this legislation through our peace and friendship treaties. Is it in accordance with the spirit of our treaties? If it's not, then we have an issue. That's the relationship with Canada. No, that's how we bring it. So, and I'm here I understand it's treaty number six that blankets this territory. What does treaty number six say about two-spirited people? Probably not a whole lot, if there's anything. But I do know that it says about education. No, that's and education is part of our Aboriginal treaty rights. So you need to see this legislation. How does it impact upon the education of our people and our two-spirited people here? So, you no, know, I always say people never, never stray too far away from them treaties. Those are very powerful stuff, you know. And even from from in treaty interpretation principle, from looking at it from the indigenous perspective, we talked about some of the number of treaties have. You know, to the depth of the plow, I think there's a clause in there. Well, is that a land, and some people you know, Canada will say that's a land cessation treaty, you know, the land, some, well, maybe, oh, you get the land six inches. That doesn't mean the oil and sands been underneath that. So again, it's also an interpretation, right? So uh, when you're reading these treaties, I always think about how the new indigenous people would have understood them and how they understand them today. Identity is an Aboriginal treaty right, and it's the foundation of all our rights. So two-spirited people are the beneficiaries of our Aboriginal treaty rights. You know. They're also the beneficiary of citizenship rights. Just because we have Aboriginal treaty rights doesn't mean we cannot benefit from other rights too. You know. and people have multiple layers. You can be a citizen of a, the Cree Nation or the Haida Nation or the Mi'kmaq Nation and also be a citizen of Canada and you can also utilize all these rights, everything. And we also are beneficiaries of international rights, such as UNDRIP, uh, International Labor Organization 169, the United Nations Covenant on the, right, uh, the, uh, the Rights of the Children. I think that was passed in 1982 or something like that, right? right? No, 70s, it was in the 70s. I remember I was in the Indian Day School at the time. So. Think about them, and all indigenous peoples, including two-spirited people, we are always at risk for having our rights taken away, especially our Aboriginal and indigenous rights. And so we always have to be vigilant when there's an infringement or an attack on one. It's an attack on all of us. Well, so as uh, two-spirited people, who are we? Yeah, remember that question people would ask, who are you? Where are you from? Who are your people? I am an indigenous two-spirited person. My people are the Mi'kmaq, and I've been always part of this community. We've always been here, two-spirited people, right? Identity is part of our worldview. It's part of our self-government, self-determination. It's part of our indigenous and our treaty rights. So, and there's multiple layers, you know. We're in, I'm an indigenous person. Um, I've been, I'm a husband, a son, a daughter, auntie, uncle, you know, um, I've been a community member, etc. I'm also a lawyer, I'm an adjudicator, there's many. I'm constantly shifting form and shape, even in the course of a day. 
I could be a professor, I could be a lawyer. I can be a trans person, I can be male, female. <coughs> We're always shifting shapes. That's very much an indigenous um, perspective. So our identity is rooted in our sovereignty and our membership in our community. You know, that's why um, we need to protect them as our two-spirited identity is part of our indigenous rights, it's part of our treaty rights, and yes, it is also part of those modern day agreements that are in place. In our territory, we have a treaty negotiation process going on, a modern day agreement process, KMKNO, uh, negotiation office, we're looking at sectorial self-government agreements in many areas. And one of the things Canada has always asked, who are the beneficiaries of your Aboriginal treaty rights? And we say, it's up to us to say who it is. It's not up to Canada, it's not up to the status, it's not up to any other things. And that right has been, that perspective has, I think, if you look at the recent Daniels case, a Métis identity, you know? That's an Aboriginal and treaty rights perspective on identity, and it's outside of that scope of Canada saying who is Indigenous and who is not. It's really up to us to do so. And same thing with us, it's up to us to define and say who is a two-spirited person and what's their roles and responsibilities in our communities. Right. So, I'm going to say, Last question, I, I, last point I'm going to make is um, we, we need allies. We can't do this alone. We two-spirit people, we have been under attack since the first French-English arrive. We've always been under attack. So this role went underground. Again, the dancing type of thing. I'm not, that stor stories are very common among all of Turtle Island, right? And so I'll tell you a little last story. Um, you know everybody, a lot of folks, when they're walking on the Red Road or in Powwow Circuit or something, they introduce themselves through their spirit names, Indian spirit names, you know, so and so has any. When I was at the Indian Day School, I was 10 years old when I was outed by the nuns there. Sister Rankin found out or determined that I was two-spirited. And she gave, and she went and told my family. And she told my parents. My parents said, yeah, we know. You were born like that. You know? and, so, and she she told him, but he, uh, she gave me my first name. He said, he's a sodomite. My family said, we don't know what that is, but his name is Duma, right? No, no, Duma the sodomite. That's kind of, they, my parents didn't know what the hell that meant, right? No, but they also knew that didn't really mean good. So anyways. <clears throat> So I didn't realize that my brother had been outed when he was in the 60s and he had to leave. I was outed in the 70s and then later on because of the work that has been happening in change, my nephew came out when it was legal for uh, same-sex marriage. My grandchild came out as trans you know, recently and we've been very supportive. You know. Mind you, my, grand, my grandchild can be a little bit of a jerk, you know, like all kids, right, teenagers, right, you know, but that, that had nothing to do with them being trans. It's just like they're still jerks, you know, <laughs> type of thing, you know, type of thing. So in that case, so today, when I tell people, you know, my old name was Sodomite, today some people now call me Wakwanamoksit Gitpo, the eagle, that's colored like the rainbow. That's my new name type of thing, okay? Well, Alio, thank you very much. It's, I know it's a lot to know in one hour, and I know that's about as much as I can, and uh, I'll be around for questions and answers if people want. Well, Alio. I want to ask our student, Hannah Bouvier, to come up and say a few words of thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Young, for coming to speak to us today and delivering a fascinating lecture. Um, on behalf of the college, I'd like to present you with this gift as something to remember us by and show our appreciation for you today. Thank you so okay. much again. Okay, well, I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you.
maybe do you want to take more sure. questions? Uh, sure. I'm here all day. So. I just want to ask you a question. Yeah. I guess the, uh, the term my, my, I would say that the term, from what I understood from my, uh, my colleague Albert McLeod in Man Manitoba, <coughs> He said that it was uh, termed either in 1988 or 87 or 88. And it was at a gathering in Minnesota um, when it was presented to the folks who were gathered there. Now, um, I also understood that Alberta, you know, when we had discussions, I said, it's still an English term. And so when I was at Gold River in 1903 at the gathering there, we talked a little bit about that. And we came to the conclusion that we'll use the term as an interim measure and that we were all supposed to go back into our own communities and find out what our indigenous words were. So yeah. I use it in that context. I, I guess the only reason why I say that all the time, I mean, I have family members who are, <coughs> we, they call themselves gay or queer. Yeah. They don't use a two-spirit term. Uh, my grandparents, when they first started talking about it, cousins who were of a different gender, like you know how they behave. We call him Ahikolo, Ahikolo, because that's the term that there are old, old people used to talk to people about in our community who are a different gender, who behave in a different gender. And one of the things, my nieces and nephews and my cousins who are, are married to a different, the same sex, they don't call themselves queer or gay, uh, mm -hmm. uh, two-spirited. Not one person has two spirits. Mm. One person has one spirit. Because of your ahi go, ahi is because you want to be something else. It go, meaning you want to be that woman too, or you want to be that man. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the term we use is ahi go. I just spoke to my uncle a few years ago, well, before he passed away, <clears throat> and he said, People all talk about two spirits. And the first thing he said, a person doesn't have two spirits. It's just a gender that he or she follows. Mm -hmm. go or no? And I've always heard that, I mentioned that to some of the few uh, researchers that I work with. You know, <clears throat> there's another term in Mohawk that I mean, uh, uh, Navasi that we suppose they have a different name. Uh, they don't use a two spirit either because I spoke with the elders out there. That's how they refer to me as that. Uh, here, me, I, I don't have any problem with people using this here. Yeah. It's not up to me to change it. But we say, I think both. Yeah, the best thing for uh, every one of us, and I keep pushing this, is that for every single uh, tribe to find out what their words are in their language. Mm -hmm. you no, know, exactly. and really, that's really what we need to do more research in that. And and I get, I tell people, go into the language. You will always find that, you know, um, I think 90% of our uh, history, culture, language loss, etc. That they're, that's why it's. That's behavior, right? Yeah. You hear something and then you use it. Yeah. yeah. Professor Young, I have uh, just one second. I have an impromptu thank you from Paulette here. If you want to okay. come up and say a couple words. Hello, my friend. Hello, Luz. On behalf of Two Spirits and Motion Side, the national organization, we wanted to give you some medicine. Oh, okay. Well, I'll eat eh? Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you. Okay, no more this. So the the term two spirit, and I thank you for your um, comment there. And it's something that we hear a lot from our non spirit relatives within the indigenous community. And again, like we had mentioned, that word two spirit is English. It's English terminology. Um, and and as Tuma had mentioned, it's very very important for our relatives to go back to our own languages because our perspective and our languages and our, our languages as indigenous people is much, much more complex than English, much more complex. So when we look at the term two spirit, I think that is a lot of, I don't want to say backlash, but the first question I hear from our indigenous relatives, like nobody has two spirits, is because you're looking at the term two spirit as a very literal, we don't mean it literal as two coming into one. It's that, that balance of those, and like you mentioned, those roles of going into those women's roles, those men's roles, and, and knowing all of that. And that, I think that's that duality we speak of. Um, that's just my, my, my kind of two cents on that. 
and then I, um, the, just the last thing I wanted to mention is when, when that term kind of came in and adopted into consensus um, within our two spirit community was um, at um, Bush Resort, Manitoba, at the uh, international, uh, now called International Two Spirit Gathering, but it was um, a different word back then. Um, and when that word Two Spirit was first brought to us, it was actually. And it wasn't even in English, it was in Anishinaabe Moen, um, in Niji Manitoba, um, because that was, um, help me out here, who's name? Yeah, it was